Howdy folks, Jambariki here, and welcome to another episode of Jambariki Orange, the show where I let my patrons decide what I review. The options for this episode's poll included Die Hard, Home Alone, Casper's Haunted Christmas, Miracle on 34th Street, Frosty the Snowman, Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas, and Sonic Christmas Blast. They chose Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas. Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas focuses on three different festive stories, starring Disney brand characters like Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, and Goofy. It also features a wraparound narrator voiced by Kelsey Grammer. One time a year, there's a marvelous night when enchantment and wonder spark and take flight. Who uses different unique gifts under a Christmas tree to inspire each tale. While critics weren't fond of this film upon release, it's gained a cult following in the Disney fan base, and lots of people consider it to be a very underrated Christmas special. Many straight-to-video Disney anthology movies tend to be clunkily stitched together episodes of a cancel spin-off cartoon. So it's quite surprising that Once Upon a Christmas delivers free original animated shorts that all smoothly connect thematically. The first segment, Stock on Christmas, is based on Christmas Every Day by William Dean Howells, and it's about Donald Duck's nephews Huey, Dewey, and Louie wishing it was Christmas every day. The nephews go through a cycle of emotions when experiencing Christmas on a loop. At first, they rejoice in the fun of repeating Christmas every single day again and again and again. I mean, what kid wouldn't? They get to open new toys, go sledding, and devour feasts every single day. It's like any child's dream come true. However, as the boys come to learn, the more you indulge in a treat, the less special it becomes. So of course it's going to lose all of its magic and wonder if it's every day. The boys start to see the downsides to their wish, from gaining pot bellies from too much Xmas food, to new presents losing their excitement, to surprises becoming predictable beats of the day. We wish you a Merry Christmas. They're sort of this monkey's paw to the whole thing, because now Christmas is their living torture, and they end up facing an existential crisis over their festive loop. Yesterday's today, and, and today's tomorrow, and it's gonna be the same thing day in and day out and day in and day out! Yes, time is trying to teach them something, but they aren't handed the answer, so they end up doing what anyone would do when stuck in infinite boredom. They force fun to happen. While the boys' chaos livens everything up for one day, and breaks the cycle for the audience, who must be just as exhausted from the repetition, it ends up bringing out the nephew's more sociopathic side, as they rebel against Christmas traditions and experiment with the freedom of no consequences. It's not a sign that these are criminals in the making, but rather just a natural stage for a lot of kids who want to see what happens when they break rules or push buttons. It's a way for them to understand responsibility for their actions. Sure, the boys don't have to worry about tomorrow, but they can't avoid seeing the damage they've caused. In a moment of humanity that shows that the boys can feel remorse and guilt, the boys feel really sorry for their family and totally regret their anarchy. Gee, I don't know about you guys, but I don't ever want to do that again. Me too. Me three. It's a coming of age experience for them that teaches all three brothers about the victims they can create if they abandon their morals. They play with fire, and the burns will shape their sense of compassion as adults. That same night, they finally read Donald's Christmas card to them, and what he wrote perfectly sums up why their selfishness goes against Christmas. It's a scene that gets my waterworks going every time. Christmas isn't about candy canes, holly, or lights all aglow. It's about the hearts that we touch, and the care that we show. And they try to make up for their bad behaviour yesterday by embracing what Christmas means to their loved ones. My only criticism is that it lumps the boys' rejection of their aunt's annual smothering kisses with their disregard towards the Christmas spirit, and naughty list bad behaviour, even though they have every right to decline her affection. It's something that's aged poorly in 2024. The cherry on top of their redemption arc was actually cleverly foreshadowed earlier. You see, whenever we saw Donald sleeping, he was dreaming of being the captain of his very own boat. We often forget that Donald is supposed to be a sailor. So after the boys restore Christmas, they also reveal that they slaved all night on a handmade boat for their uncle. Not only showing that the boys understand the deeper meaning of giving presents now, but that they also fought really hard about what to give their uncle Donald this Christmas. It's a beautiful bookend to a growing up story. See? It's your dream boat, Uncle Donald! Oh, <laughs> thank you, boys. 
Let's now move on to the next segment, A Very Goofy Christmas. A sweet story of the goofs questioning their faith in Santa after Pete insists that he doesn't exist. Ain't that quaint? The goof brain thinks there's a Santa Claus. There isn't? One thing I love about this short is that it never shames or judges Max's crisis of faith. No one says that he has to believe in Santa. Sure, Goofy tries to keep Max optimistic, but only because he doesn't like seeing his son feeling upset at Christmas. Remember the old goof tradition of eating one of Sandy's cookies for bedtime? Max is totally allowed to raise concerns and questions about the logic of Father Christmas. That means Santa would have to make like 800 visits a second, not including bathroom breaks. It's no surprise that Goofy loves Christmas time. He's a wholesome dude full of love and optimism. This is his perfect holiday. I mean, Goofy is the kind of man who will give up his Christmas time to feed a poor family and be Santa for their kids. He doesn't do this to impress the community or clear his conscience. He genuinely loves being a charitable gentleman. With things being so tight this year, well, without you, we wouldn't have... Oh, don't mention it. <laughs> You'd do the same for me. He's such an amazing role model for both kids and adults. But at the same time, Goofy does face his own dissolution over the Santa myth after he starts sharing Max's newfound pessimism. Goofy has never really grown up, and he's kind of a big kid at heart. And I do get the impression that Goofy's parents never gave him the Santa talk. But the movie never mocks him for being a late bloomer, or makes jokes about him for believing in Santa for so long. In fact, he's allowed to grieve his feelings, and marinate in the idea that his lifetime hero is made up. Heck, it understandably hits Goofy even harder than Max, because Goofy is believed for longer, and maybe Santa's godlike existence helped Goofy through his adult life in this scary world. But movingly, Max, who Goofy tried to support earlier, returns the same exact gesture by adorably reenacting everything his dad did for him earlier, showing that Max has learned the importance of making others happy at Christmas. Oh, you better watch out! You better not cry! You better not cry! I'm telling you why! Cause Santa Claus is coming to town! I really love that when Max dresses as Santa and accidentally exposes himself, Goofy doesn't scold Max or lose his temper, because he appreciates what Max was trying to do. He remembers that his role is to be there for Max, not the other way around. This is Bluey level parenting. Oh, Maxie, I might have let you down, but you sure didn't let me down. Now, yes, it does turn out that Santa is actually real. I mean, come on, it would have been cynical and mean-spirited if this kid's movie didn't end with some kind of reassurance. But the film still let the goofs have a chance to question their belief for one night which is always healthy. A Very Goofy Christmas is a terrific short about a father and son sharing a crisis of faith that respects and validates people's right to ask if a higher being exists or not. But it's also simply a very wholesome Goof Troop episode that celebrates what makes Goofy so wonderful as a person and as a father. Sand didn't forget your gift, did he? Every year, I ask for the same gift, and every year I get it. What's that? Your happiness. Finally, we have the last segment, Gift of the Magi, based on a short story by O. Henry. This short is about Mickey and Minnie, who are trying to work hard at Christmas so that they can afford gifts for each other. This short is a bit of change of pace, focusing more on working class struggling characters, the kind that the everyday audience might relate to more. Despite their hardships, Mickey and Minnie share a sweet relationship, made even more adorable by how they tease each other with their gift ideas. I'll bet it'll look real nice with a gold chain around your pretty neck. Aw, Mickey. <laughs> Which is why it's so heartbreaking to see Minnie get a fruitcake instead of a bonus, and Mickey gets his salary deducted just for showing compassion to a poor family. Both situations are not only sad story turns, but also strong commentaries on the way that businesses underpay their staff or look down on lower paying customers. I also like how Pete returns in this short, because it cements him as this symbol for anti-Christmas in the movie's anthology, representing the opposite of the Christmas spirit, a dishonest, greedy, and selfish man who shows no pity for the underprivileged. I had them on the hook for a 10-foot tree! <laughs> I'm taking what I would have made off of that tree out of your face! <laughs> While we don't get to see what happens to Minnie, we do get to follow Mickey, who suddenly finds himself being dragged into playing harmonica for a firehouse charity stage show, while the firefighters themselves are busy on duty. You might just see this scene as a distraction, but it actually plays a big part in the short's running theme of the power of music. You see, Mickey's festive harmonica playing inspires an increase in donations. Even though Mickey has his own problems today, he uses his music for a good cause, while substituting for hard-working firefighters. It's a beautiful sentiment on Mickey's part. 
The scene also ends with someone telling Mickey that the harmonica has a lot of value, which inspires him to sell it, but he doesn't have long until the pawn shop closes. So we get this exciting rush for time, which brings some thrilling action into an otherwise quiet laid back short. <laughs> The pawnbroker sees no value to Mickey's harmonica, leaving the poor guy heartbroken. But when he channels his sadness, regret, and disappointment into his harmonica, with no intention to manipulate the pawnbroker, all those deep emotions come out as powerful music that happens to reach the pawnbroker's heart. Say, uh... Maybe that harmonica is worth something after all. Like I said, this short is great at exploring what music can do at Christmas. Then we reach the most memorable part of the whole movie. Mickey reveals that he sold his harmonica for Minnie's watch chain, and Minnie confesses that she sold her watch for a harmonica case for Mickey. What seems like a disappointing twist at first actually shows the deeper meaning of gift giving, stripping down the presents themselves to the raw love behind them. This Christmas, Minnie and Mickey sacrifice their most cherished properties to make the other feel happy and loved. It's one of the most heartwarming moments in Disney animation history to me. I can't believe you gave up what means the most to you for me. <laughs> oh, Minnie, you're all the music I'll ever need. <laughs> the film ends with the narrator summing up the message of Christmas, which is love. And you know what? I think this film did an amazing job carrying that simple but true theme all the way through every short. When you break all three segments down, they're all about love. Sometimes an anthology doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas shows that when given the chance, Disney's straight to video team could produce meaningful movies. With the same heart, magic and effort as any theatrical film. This is one time in which I think the critics were dead wrong. So those are my thoughts on Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas. What did you think of this movie? Let everyone know in the comment section below. So what am I going to be reviewing in the next episode of Jamboree Orange? Well, that's entirely up to my patrons. The options for the next episode's poll include Barbie, Oppenheimer, Strange Magic, Mulan 2, Playmobil the Movie, and Mickey, Donald, and Goofy in The Three Musketeers. That's a pretty awesome selection, am I right? Now, don't forget that you have to be a patron in order to access this poll. What is a patron? Don't worry, I'll explain. This is my Patreon. It's a site for my fans to support me financially on through a monthly basis. Those who donate are called patrons. Patrons can donate as much as they want and are welcome to stop donating any time. In return for their generosity, patrons are given exciting rewards based on their pledge amount. These rewards include early access to my videos before they go up publicly on YouTube, behind the scenes content, their name and the end credits of my videos, a chance to request a review of anything at all, and much more. I'm very excited to find out what my patrons vote for next. I've been Jambariki. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Cheerio, folks. Dashing through the snow in one horse open sleigh. O'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. Bells on bobtail ring.